Hello, my name is Hassan Miranda. I'm in the, uh, responsible for the diffusion of knowledge from the RCGI. And today, you have a pleasure to have uh, Professor Sonny Coelho uh, to give you our colloquial. Uh, Professor Sonny uh, is a commendator from the Order of Arizona, one of the highest uh, uh, merits here in New Zealand in the science. She has done uh, a degree in chemical engineering and also the graduate uh, in energy from the University of Sao Paulo. She's also responsible for the program of uh, uh, graduate program in energy. And nowadays, uh, she's very involved with on the RCGI uh, with uh, the biomass, bio generation biomass, the decentralization generation, even in rural Saudi waste, among it, several other uh, topics, mainly regarding to death and all the sugar cane and the hydrogen production. So with that, it's a pleasure to have Professor Sweeney Quedo, and I need to have to provide that talk. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Ketan, for the introduction and the kind words about me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank you very much, the Research Center for Green Health Against Innovation, for the invitation for this colloquium. And uh, I'm going to present a brief overview of what uh, we have been doing uh, regarding this uh, subject. Uh, so we are going to talk about perspectives for hydrogen from biomass in Brazil, uh, discussing the different sources that can be used to produce hydrogen. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contribution of my uh, PhD candidate, Danilo Perezzi, uh, who helped me with the slides, uh, but also to acknowledge the contribution of all uh, students and postdoc fellow uh, working with me in the Research Center for Green House Gas Innovation and on the uh, Institute of Energy and Environment. Uh, so uh, let's start from the very beginning. Why hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is considered a, a key element for the energy transition. And uh, considering that we need to reduce uh, carbon emissions and to keep uh, global temperature in strict limits, it's important to have options for energy transition. And then hydrogen can be used in different forms. Uh, first, uh, fuel for transport or for power production. Uh, as a source for heat, for industries, different types of industries and buildings, both residential and commercial. And also hydrogen can be used as a feedstock to produce chemicals, products uh, in different industrial sectors. Uh, in fact, uh, we can produce hydrogen from different sources and uh, it's more or less uh, a common uh, agreement that uh, we can have different colors uh, for hydrogen uh, depending on the type of uh, technology, depending on the feedstock, and depending on the greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we can have the gray hydrogen uh, when hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels like natural gas, crude oil, coal. Uh, for different sor uh, sources and different pathways, like uh, steam reform, gasification, and so on. Uh, the next one is what we call blue hydrogen. Uh, when we put together uh, these uh, fossil fuel sources and CCS. CCS means carbon capture and storage, which is considered a nice opportunity to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. So uh, when we put together fossil fuel and CCS, uh, we can we have uh, the so-called blue hydrogen. The pathways, the technological pathways are the same. The difference is that we are adding CCS in the process. Uh, still going on, uh, we can have uh, pyrolysis of natural gas with uh, corresponding to the so-called turquoise hydrogen. And then 
we come to the main important subject that we consider, uh, the uh, green hydrogen. Uh, green hydrogen uh, means that we are producing hydrogen from renewable sources. So we can produce uh, green hydrogen from uh, renewable electricity uh, using water electrolytes. This renewable energy uh, is mainly uh, wind and the solar PV systems, but uh, we can also have uh, renewable electricity from biomass, bioelectricity as a source of electrolytes. Uh, we can produce green hydrogen from biogas through uh, steam reformer and other process together or not with CCS. Uh, even if you do not add CCS, we still have a green hydrogen because biogas uh, is a renewable source. And finally, uh, we can have a solid biomass as a source uh, through the process of gasification. Uh, gasification uh, together or not CCS, Again, even if we do not have a CCS, uh, we have green hydrogen because solid biomass is a renewable uh, source. Important to note that when we are talking to biomass, about biomass, we are discussing sustainable biomass, which means biomass produced in a sustainable way. And finally, we have the yellow uh, hydrogen produced from nuclear electricity through water electrolysis. Uh, some other references say that uh, uh, hydrogen from biomass uh, would have a, a different type of dark green, more or less, but this presentation here, we are using the reference which puts together all the types of renewable hydrogen. Uh, in fact, uh, it's important that you have a low carbon hydrogen, and then from all the previous pathways that we discussed in the previous slide, uh, we can have uh, clean electricity through water electrolysis. We can have natural gas or coal together with CCS through reforming or gasification, and we can have biomass uh, through gasification, reforming, or bioelectrolysis. Uh, we can also integrate uh, all these systems. This uh, flow sheet shows possibilities to integrate uh, biomass producing hydrogen together with uh, hydrogen from wind and from other renewables, uh, together with uh, hydrogen storage, and then having hydrogen, sorry, uh, then ha having hydrogen storage, hydrogen fueling, and then using in vehicles. Uh, we can also have hydrogen in fuel cells and engines, and then uh, to get putting the electricity in hydrogen to electric grid. Uh, we can have together CO2 uh, storage together with hydrogen and producing uh, other uh, fuels uh, and to be used in uh, vehicles. Um, when we talk about uh, ethanol reforming, which is an important perspective for Brazil and for the world, as we are going to discuss, it's important uh, to note that we have significant figures. Here, uh, we can see that if we look at the United States, which is the largest producer of ethanol from corn, and when we look at Brazil, which is the second largest producer and the largest producer on ethanol from sugarcane, we have the largest uh, figures, the higher figures to produce uh, ethanol. Uh, and then to produce hydrogen. Uh, we can see here that uh, if we use the ethanol production worldwide to produce hydrogen, we could have uh, a potential of 13 million tons 
of hydrogen. Um, what are the challenges? Hydrogen is still very expensive, but existing studies show that we can have important reduction on production costs. This figure shows uh, figures for 2019, 2013, and 2050. Uh, here we can see that in 2019, uh, we had green hydrogen uh, with a higher cost when compared to blue hydrogen from coal or from gas. But if we look to the forecast for 2030 and 2050, we can see a significant reduction on production costs of green hydrogen, uh, even becoming lower than natural gas or coal-based hydrogen. So uh, despite the fact that we have today higher costs for green hydrogen, the perspectives show that uh, we can reduce these costs. Uh, we have uh, some expected uh, cost reduction for green hydrogen. Uh, and what is important? Important is electricity cost, electrolyzer cost, the conversion efficiency, the number of load hours, the operating lifetime, and capital costs. Uh, electrolyzer costs are one of the important perspectives of cost reduction. Then electricity costs are the second one important uh, sub figure to reduce uh, green hydrogen costs. And uh, then we can see that in the future, we can have very low costs for green hydrogen if we put together all these uh, cost reductions. Important that these figures come from IBRINA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, in a study published in 2020. So it's a very recent uh, study. Uh, important to note that uh, we have a trend to reduce uh, electricity costs from wind and from uh, solar PV, uh, as we can see in these figures. And then uh, the idea of reducing uh, electricity costs and then to reduce the hydrogen costs uh, is an interesting option. <clears throat> In US and Europe, uh, there are several uh, policies being discussed uh, considering hydrogen production. Uh, we have strategies uh, defined in European Union and also in uh, US. Uh, in European Union, uh, in 2022, uh, hydrogen corresponded to less than 2% of Europe's energy consumption, primarily used to produce chemicals such as plastics and fertilizers. But 90% was produced from natural gas, which, the, which means that we still have significant CO2 emissions because this hydrogen produced from natural gas in Europe is not uh, coupled to CCS. That's why we have the CO2 emissions. The European Commission proposed by 2030 to produce 10 million tons of hydrogen and to import additional 10 million tons. And uh, in US, you can see in the figure on the right, we can see that the uh, green hydrogen with tax credits can have redu reduced costs and maybe become becoming very competitive. Uh, regarding Europe, it's important to remember that Europe now faces a significant uh, struggle on energy supply, uh, mainly because of natural gas, because natural gas mostly comes from Russia, and with the Russia 
war against Ukraine and uh, all the consequences, uh, we have an important reduction on natural gas supply from Russia. So uh, Europe is looking for other options uh, for natural gas replacement. Uh, thinking about biomass, uh, we can couple uh, hydrogen uh, with bags with bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. Here, it's important to remember that when we produce biomass in a sustainable way, which means no deforestation, uh, we have the carbon cycle almost zero. Uh, here, you can see CO2 being absorbed in the photosynthesis process. That's why we can talk about the carbon balance almost zero. The biomass uh, produced from forestry, agriculture, or residues goes for the industries. In this process, we have uh, CO2 emissions, even if these CO2 emissions are uh, biogenic, which means they are absorbed in photosynthesis, but we can also you capture this CO2 to transport and do geological storage. Uh, then we have conversion, and then we can produce liquid biofuels, biogas, uh, hydrogen, pellets, bioproducts, and so on. Then uh, we can have uh, here one of the options uh, is the production of hydrogen uh, together with bats, which means an important potential to maximize uh, bats and helping energy transition. So, uh, if we have uh, hydrogen from biomass, and if you have hydrogen with CCS are two important options. But if we put together and we have hydrogen from biomass and hydrogen from CCS with bags, then we have an important option with negative emissions for this green hydrogen. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, CO2 production, mainly in the case of the Brazilian sugarcane. Uh, we have uh, sug uh, sugarcane production uh, producing CO2 in different phases of the process. Uh, we have uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions from the straw, uh, the result of the uh, mechanical harvesting of sugarcane, because this straw nowadays is left in the soil, in the sugarcane fields, and then we have these CO2 emissions there. Uh, we have uh, CO2 uh, from the bagasse combustion. We have CO2 from uh, sugarcane fermentation to produce ethanol. We have CO2 from the biodigestion of byproducts like VNAS and uh, filter cake. Uh, so uh, here uh, we see that we can have 36% of the CO2 emissions in the fields. We have around 62% post-combustion CO2 capture in the boilers. 9% from fermentation, 17% uh, could come from ethanol reforming, and 4% uh, from biogas reforming. So we have different options for uh, carbon balance uh, with biogenic carbon being captured and put together with hydrogen. And why hydrogen for Brazil? Uh, Recently, I was giving more or less this speech in an international workshop, and this was a very common question. They asked, if you have already so many uh, uh, renewable energy and biofuels, why do you need hydrogen? And then we could answer this question, saying that we have two major issues for the need of hydrogen. 
uh, we sorry we have the need for fertilizers brazil is a major agricultural producer with soybeans corn and sugarcane uh, fertilizers account for around 30 percent of the cost of major pro crops mainly in the state of mato grosso which is a big uh, agricultural producer uh, we had a recent increase uh, in the price of uh, fertilizers. Uh, we have more than 80% of fertilizers imported in Brazil. So uh, the use of hydrogen as a raw material to produce fertilizer is an important uh, option. On the other hand, we also can use hydrogen as a next step for energy transition. Despite the fact that we have uh, ethanol production, very large production, almost 30 billion liters, and we use this ethanol mainly in light vehicles, passenger vehicles, and uh, our uh, heavy vehicles, freight and buses, we use diesel. And we have a strong diesel consumption in the country. And it's important to remember that Brazil imports 25% uh, of the diesel that we consume in the country. This is because the refineries that we have in the country are not enough to produce all the diesel that we need. So we import pure diesel, 25% of the consumption. So it's important to have options uh, to replace diesel. Of course, we can think about uh, biomethane and having trucks uh, filled with biomethane, but we can also have uh, the possibility of hydrogen, uh, even because when we talk about hydrogen, we are not using combust combustion engine, we are using fuel cells, which have a very higher efficiency. Uh, fuel cells are not limited by the second thermodynamic law, and so uh, they are not uh, struggled by these uh, perspectives. So, uh, uh, when we are looking to uh, change fuels, uh, we have, uh, as I said, ethanol replacing gasoline, uh, in light vehicles, and we could have the same sugar cane that produce ethanol could produce hydrogen to replace diesel with uh, energy conversion efficiency much higher than an internal combustion engine. So, coming back to the Brazilian sugar cane industry. Uh, Brazil is the uh, most important sugarcane ethanol producer. We are the second one worldwide after the United States, but the United States produces from ethanol, and Brazil produces mainly from sugarcane. Uh, we produce around 27 billion liters of ethanol, uh, which supplies 38% of, of Brazil light vehicles energy demand. Uh, together with ethanol, uh, we produce 42 uh, million tons of sugar, which corresponds to 23% of total global production. Uh, and Brazil is the largest producer of sugar and the first net producer of sugar. Together with uh, fuel and food, because here we can see that there is no a competition about fuel and food, we produce both. Uh, we produce also electricity from sugarcane bagasse. Uh, the last season produces 39 terawatt hour of electricity, corresponding to more than 6% of the total national supply, being 41% of this amount for self-consumption, 16 terawatt hour, and the rest of it uh, being supplied to the uh, grid, uh, being distributed all over the country. And finally, we have a new product, biogas and biomethane, uh, 
be introduced in the sugarcane sector. Uh, we have already in Sao Paulo State two commercial scale plants in operation, one uh, producing electricity from biogas, 20 megawatts, another producing biomethane and bioelectricity. Uh, this uh, plant producing 20 megawatts is the so-called Bolfin Mill in the state of Sao Paulo, and the other one producing biomethane and biogas is cocoa. Uh, important to note that all these products are produced from sugarcane, uh, and uh, we have only 1% uh, of the Brazilian land uh, use uh, to produce the sugarcane. Uh, we uh, use it in this last uh, harvesting session, a little bit more than 9 million hectares uh, with sugarcane. And this corresponds to 1.1% of Brazilian surface. So it's a very small area uh, being used for sugarcane, and most pro uh, production of sugarcane and possible increase is mainly due to increases in uh, agricultural and industrial productivity and not in land use change. And then uh, we have this specific uh, possibilities to produce hydrogen and even to get with bags. We can produce, oh, sorry. Uh, we can produce hydrogen from ethanol reforming, and then we can put together with CO2, both from bagasse or from fermentation, we can produce hydrogen using electrolysis from bagasse-based electricity. We can produce hydrogen from biogas reforming. So we have several options uh, to produce hydrogen in the sugarcane sector. And then all, most all of them can be put together with bags. Uh, we did a very... Uh, short uh, calculations, very draft figures, uh, comparing the perspectives of hydrogen potential for the Brazilian sugarcane sector. So uh, we have done these calculations together with Raizen. Raizen is the largest sugarcane producer in, the, in Brazil. Uh, and so these figures were mainly discussed with them. So uh, uh, we have a potential of 80 tons of sugarcane per hectare being produced. We consider that we could have 40 liters of ethanol per ton of cane. This is because we are considering a, a meal producing both ethanol and uh, sugar. If we produce only uh, ethanol and not sugar, we would have double this. 80 liters of ton, per ton of cane. Uh, we can produce 23 liters of ethanol second generation uh, per ton of cane. We can have uh, surplus electricity and we have a biogas production. So if we calculate all the hydrogen production in these different sources and we calculate the potential, uh, we arrive here that for a sugar cane production, of 654 million tons of cane, which correspond to the last uh, sugarcane harvesting season, we could have more than 6.5 million tons of hydrogen. So we have a very important potential, but of course we still need adequate policies to incentivate it. Uh, here, I'm not going into detail, uh, this is the studies being developed by our uh, postdoc fellow, Ad Andrea Gutierrez, uh, looking at hydrogen production from biogas. Uh, the idea is to have the capture of biogas, do the biogas upgrading, then uh, the steam reform of biomethane, and then purification and hydrogen production. 
uh, one of the, these perspectives is uh, forecasted to happen in northeast of Brazil, in Fortaleza, the capital of Ceará State, in northeast of Brazil. Uh, in Fortaleza, uh, the landfill uh, produces already uh, biomethane. They are the largest biomethane producer uh, in Brazil from municipal solid waste, uh, producing 90,000 cubic meters of per day of biomethane, which corresponds to 15% of the local utility gas supply. And uh, we estimate that the potential for hydrogen in this plant would be 18,000 kilos per day. Uh, so uh, this is an important project being uh, forecasted uh, in Sierra State. Uh, our, uh, the same postdoc fellow, Andrea Gutierrez, did a preliminary analysis of the potential for hydrogen production from biogas in the sanitation uh, sector. And then uh, we can see here that, of course, Sao Paulo is the largest potential because of the uh, large number of inhabitants. But then we can have here the different figures for each state. And here we have a georeferenced mapping uh, for hydrogen potential. And we can see here that from uh, the sanitation sector, we can have a potential to, for hydrogen production of 2.34 million per year. Another option is the hydrogen production from municipal solid waste gasification, also from the postdoc fellow Andrea Gutierrez. The idea is to do the gasification of municipal solid waste. Uh, of course, to do this gasification, we need to produce before that the so-called refuse derived fuel. When we take out uh, humidity and we dry the, the waste and we crush the waste, so we produce re, uh, refuse derived fuel. And this fuel is fed in the gasific gasifier. And then the gasifier producing uh, syngas, hydrogen and carbon monoxide, and the syngas can be used to produce hydrogen. So we still have here uh, the potential of hydrogen production from uh, RGF gasification, from mainly for small and medium municipalities, where this pathway to convert the municipal solid waste is the most indicated. And we can have here the georeference mapping for Brazil with a potential of uh, 175,000 tons per year. Important to note that uh, when we talk about uh, small and medium municipalities, we do not have so many options uh, for disposal of municipal solid waste and gasification is more and more becoming an option important. And we have now in the country two pilot plants being built uh, with this technology uh, in Boa Esperança and in Extrema in Minas Gerais State. And last but not least, our latest news, uh, LCGI has a new project being developed by Shell, Raizen, Hydro, and University of Sao Paulo, uh, which is a partnership to convert ethanol into renewable hydrogen. The idea is to build a fueling station here in the University of Sao Paulo at the Butantan campus, and then we will receive the ethanol produced from sugarcane from Raizen, transported this ethanol to the campus, and here producing uh, hydrogen through the process of ethanol reformer, uh, and this hydrogen being used uh, in buses. So uh, we have, as I said, four steps. The first one is sugarcane process in the biorefinery, producing ethanol together with the other products. 
this ethanol produced uh, is transported to the fuel station at USP and stored. Then we have the ethanol steam reforming, producing hydrogen. Uh, we start with one pilot plan of 4.5 kilos of hydrogen per hour. Uh, and uh, we, we are going to use 38.5 liters of ethanol per hour and 45 liters of water per hour. The idea is to scale up these plants, uh, but uh, in the moment, the idea is to have this hydrogen compressed and stored, supplying for campus buses. So, uh, what are the advantages of this on-site ethanol reforming model? Uh, we do not need retrofitting in the existing biorefineries. Uh, the, ref the biorefineries, the sugarcane mills can focus only uh, on their own investments like biogas, biomethane, CCS, second generation ethanol. We do not need hydrogen pipelines. We can use the existing liquid fuel distribution. We avoid costs and deadlocks in building new infrastructure and we reduce the chances of hydrogen leakage, which is an important uh, challenge. Uh, we have potential for on-demand hydrogen production, reducing hydrogen storage capacity requirements, and uh, water-dependent green hydrogen. Uh, it's important, again, uh, to remember that this biomethane uh, can be uh, used to produce hydrogen and important link uh, with uh, the sugar, between sugarcane and fertilizer industries. Uh, we have an existing project under development with uh, IARA fertilizantes, uh, fertilizer industries, uh, going to deliver the first Brazilian green ammonia by the end of this year. Uh, they are going to purchase 20,000 cubic meters per day from Haizen mill, replacing 3% of the, their current natural gas use. And they have plans to run 100% of biomethane by 2030. Important to note that uh, we, our research group on bioenergy have developed a study together with the other fertilizers, uh, forecasting the biomethane potential uh, around the, the, the industry. And this biomethane is going to be injected into Congas utility pipelines and then delivered to Yara. It's a circular economy concept because it studies uh, for using biomethane power trucks to transport fertilizer to farms as well. So, uh, preliminary conclusions show that we have significant potential for hydrogen from sugarcane and the other sources. We have a, a cleaner fuel and possibility for negative carbon footprint with putting together hydrogen production in bags. We can contribute for the decarbonization of heavy vehicles. We have an important potential use for fertilizer production. Uh, we can have hydrogen produce, produced from sugarcane plants in Brazil. We hope so. Uh, if we had adequate policies. That's why we have an interrogation mark in this bullet. We depend on policies. Uh, also, Brazilian civil society must understand the need for change for hydrogen, and we sh should inform the several publics that uh, how this could be impact the overall uh, country. And of course, uh, we need for adequate policies uh, which are not yet in place. I just want to uh, recognize the contribution of our uh, researchers and the students. Uh, in this case of this presentation, I would like to mention uh, Dr. Marilyn Dos Santos working on bags in sugarcane sector. 
Dr. Vanessa Garcilas working on biogas from Finas. Dr. Beethoven uh, from Colombia just arrived uh, working on uh, back and hydrogen and sugarcane sector. And we have Dr. Andrea also from Colombia working with uh, hydrogen in, from municipal solid waste. Dr. Fabio Soares working on hydrogen from uh, animal residues. Uh, what else, uh, Monica? Uh, Antonio Stucchi, our PhD candidate working with Bex on sugarcane sector. And uh, Danilo Perezin, PhD candidate, which was uh, very helpful producing all these nice slides that you could see here. Uh, part from Danilo, part from Andrea, they are, besides the content, the significant scientific content, they are very nice to produce beautiful slides, as you could see here. And then that's it. Thank you uh, to LCGI, thank you to the University of Sao Paulo and all the sponsors that we have for this project that we are doing here. Thank you, Professor Caetan. I give you back the Thank floor. You very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sandi. It was very nice to have this overview on the hydrogen production based on the ethanol. Maybe I started uh, with the last point that you, you call us the attention, that is the, uh, the lack of politics on the hydrogen uh, production here in Brazil. So do you, do you have a, at least a strategic plan to for, in this direction, or which actions actually you could do in order to have it? Uh, in fact, it question of one million dollars, as we say, uh, because this is exactly the bottleneck that we have in Brazil. And uh, I would like to come back and to mention another issue that we still have a problem in Brazil, uh, which is the lack of adequate support to the Renovabuy. I did not mention Renovabuy, which is the carbon credit program that we have in Brazil. But recently, uh, after the COVID pandemic, uh, we had a significant reduction on the targets of Renovabuy. And not only for these years, but also the forecast of targets in the future. And this is not good for the sector because Renovabuy is a carbon credit program, is a, an opportunity to help the sugar candy ethanol, the biofuels program uh, to work better and to receive some funds coming from the fossil fuels, which is quite an interesting option. But then uh, the targets of Renovabuy were reduced. So I think that the first thing, uh, we really need uh, to have our policymakers to acknowledge the importance of the biofuel sector as a whole, not only for sugarcane, ethanol, biodiesel, uh, and hydrogen as a whole, uh, because we know that uh, there are several uh, challenges and we have to put together all that. Uh, it's uh, it's still under discussion, uh, the injection of biomethane in the natural gas grid. Uh, we have been working with that for a lot of time, and my colleagues here know that very well. And we were not able uh, to uh, have a policy making mandatory the injection of biomethane in the grid. So I think that we still have other important policies to happen before we arrive on hydrogen, but we could do it all together. We could do mandatory to inject uh, biomethane into the grid, but also to inject hydrogen into the grid. We could work together, but we still do not have, uh, I would say, following my colleague, Dr. Karen, we do not have the adequate public perception of the importance of these, uh, these fuels uh, for the country. So the other point is uh, regarding to uh, the sugarcane industry, by the way. So which actions do you think that uh, could be done in order to situate the sugarcane uh, industry to embrace the hydrogen production? We 
maybe we should come back to the previous targets of renewable. This is the first thing to be done. Uh, and second, really to work hard on policies making mandatory the injection of renewable gases into the natural gas uh, pipelines. I think these are the, the, the main uh, issues that we could uh, comment. And you show us very in a very interesting way in the, how scalable would be the uh, the on-site ethanol reforming model that you show to us. Uh, in fact, the, the ethanol reform in this project is being developed by Hydro, which is an important uh, company uh, partner of uh, SCGI. Uh, we could have. Uh, some support and even economic incentives so we could enlarge this production and even to have other companies doing that. Uh, I would say that most uh, plants uh, looking for green hydrogen are working with uh, uh, electrolysis using photovoltaic and the wind but not so many working with hydrogen from biomass. And so this is the importance of this process uh, developed together with hydro. And from your perspective, how much is our technology to have the backs and with the carbon capture? Uh, this is something that we are still discussing. Uh, we have this project where uh, Marilyn is working with the best uh, potential in the state of Sao Paulo. And we have uh, our partner, Professor Colombo, uh, having a look on the existing sites to inject the, the CO2. But uh, we should also have a look on the use of a CO2, uh, the adequate use, not to, uh, in order to avoid leakages to the atmosphere, of course, but we still have this important option. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, as far as I know, we have uh, one important uh, plant uh, doing that uh, in Paraná State. We have a mill, Copcana, uh, uh, capturing CO2 from the fermentation and selling this CO2 to an industry, how the industry, and this industry is producing uh, green uh, bic sodium bicarbonate. And they are selling this sodium bicarbonate as the green chemicals. Uh, so it's a very important circular uh, option. Uh, and uh, we have other uh, mills starting to look at that. Uh, we have in Mato Grosso uh, one mill producing uh, ethanol from corn. And they announced the project of doing backs uh, in Mato Grosso. Uh, so I would mention these are the main important uh, issues that we have. But of course, uh, we have perspectives to enlarge it. And we know that the, in the sugarcane sector, they are really very much interested on that. In the, your conclusions, you highlight the importance to bring to the general public the idea about the hydrogen. So which strategy do you think that it could be? Uh, yes, I think, I think we should uh, show uh, the importance, not, uh, not only of hydrogen, but also the importance of, of biofuels. And I'd like to, to mention uh, a, a small story that the experience I have with my students. I give classes here at the USP, and uh, in general, in the, my first class, I always ask my students, uh, what vehicle you have? Of course, all of them, they have flex vehicles because most of the vehicles are flex. Then I ask, uh, what do you use, gasoline or ethanol? Most said I use gasoline. And when I ask them, this is because of economics, you compare the prices to see 
Some of them, they just say, no, I just go for gasoline because it's easier, because the vehicle runs uh, better with gasoline and so on. So it's really a question of public perception that for sure Dr. Karen could help us to develop. So, uh, and we are talking about ethanol, and ethanol is the fuel that we have since the 70s uh, in Brazil, and we still have this wrong, I'd say, perception. So we still have to work a lot uh, on, on biofuels uh, to make it, uh, society understand better the importance of them. If you do, do a prediction in terms of time, uh, for how long you could see this technology taking place here? Well, since we have now a pilot plant for ethanol reform here, we have a pilot, uh, a big plant of biomethane reformer in Sierra State. I need it is only a question of adequate investments. We do not need it, not so much more. We just need the investment, and then of course to have investments, we must have adequate policies. See. You see, in Sierra State, uh, they produce biomethane. They sell biomethane to the gas utility in Sierra. For the selling price is 30% more than what they pay for natural gas because they are buying a green gas, the biomethane. So more or less the same is going to happen uh, with uh, hydrogen. This shows that if we have the adequate policy as they have there in Sierra, we can have things happening. Perfect. I don't know if you have any further questions. Andrea, Marilyn, Fabi, if I said something wrong, you are part of uh, the game, uh, you can correct me. <laughs> okay. So, once again, yeah. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, Professor Sony, it was a very uh, insightful uh, colloquium. Okay, thank you very much. It was my pleasure.